Hello everyone and welcome to this unit of our Integrating Sexual Health Community where this week we're focusing on promoting sexual health. So whichever module you're, you're undertaking at the moment, whether you're on sexual health skills, maybe a dissertation student or on any of the master's degrees, um, you're very welcome indeed. The sexual health skills students in week six actually focus on um, talking about sexual health. So that's talking about sexual health in practice and especially looking at ways of making effective sexual health assessments, whether that's sexual history taking or sexual risk assessments as they're um, quite often called. So it's combining all of those elements together to look at uh, talking about sexual health. Here as we're talking on this particular site, we're going to focus um, um, now this week on promoting sexual health. So again, whichever module you're on or whichever uh, uh, whichever program you're on, you're used to ways of talking about sexual health, but how can you actively and intentionally promote it? That's what we'll focus on today. But before I go any further, I just wanted to show you this next little photograph. Let me make it larger for you here. That happened at graduation at the university in October of 2021 and uh, the Vice Chancellor was really great, gracious to us that she came and stood with us and she congratulated all our uh, graduates that day. And the ones I want to point out to you here, and these are only a small selection, um, standing to the right of the Vice Chancellor is Francine Gonzalez Walters, and she finished the MSc, uh, the MA in healthcare practice, and she's graduated with distinction. Um, she didn't do sexual health, but the reason why she was there, a very important day for her, on the day of her graduation, she also found out that she'd been accepted um, to be a full-time member of staff at the university, working in our new simulation centre and uh, with adult nursing. And in the simulation center, we're also looking at ways of doing simulation around all aspects of um, HIV, contraception, sexual health. We're looking at ways of incorporating that into the various uh, simulation experiences. Standing on the vice chancellor's left, is Jane Brooke. Again, she's another person that completed the MA, but Jane was a very special case here. She um, graduated with MA with distinction, but at the same ceremony, she also graduated with a first class honours degree, the BSc Honours in Professional Practice, Sexual Health Route, which a number of you are doing at the moment. Um, Jane is a nurse and a midwife. She didn't have a bachelor's degree, but uniquely she had a postgraduate diploma in sonography. So she, um, uh, she applied to do the top up MA, but she wanted to complete a bachelor degree first. So she did the top up BSc ONS that so many of you um, are studying at the moment. She did that. But be because of the first COVID lockdown, her very final module in evidence-based practice didn't run when she was expecting it to run. So she couldn't complete the bachelor degree before starting on the master's. So I had to get special permission for her to do the two programs simultaneously. That's not normally allowed, but she did. So it means that she graduated at one of the same ceremony with a bachelor degree and a master's degree in the same ceremony. The other people you'll see in the photo here, Dr. Michael Fanner. Um, Michael did his PhD with us. I was really fortunate to be his first supervisor for the years in which he was studying with us. And he studied um, child exploitation policy um, uh, as child exploitation affects young boys and males. Standing on Michael's right, um, is it Ruth from St. Mary's Paddington? Again, she completed the degree uh, that so many of you are doing, the BSc Honours Professional Practice Sexual Health Route. Um, and she was one who started by doing sexual health skills, didn't think that she'd be uh, carrying on with all of this, but did, and then successfully completed her bachelor degree. And standing on her right, the final person there is Dr. Jackie Stevenson. 
And Jackie's PhD was focusing on uh, research looking at women who are living with HIV in London who weren't expecting to live into older age because so many people diagnosed a few decades ago didn't have the life expectations that we now know are available to people with HIV. So Jackie's research was focusing on um, looking at growing old as a woman with HIV in London. So some great sexual health um, uh, achievements for our graduation in that particular uh, cohort and there were others as well. Now with uh, week six of this particular integrating sexual health site so we've managed to get to this far already so the the point I was asking you all is what have you learned about sexual health this week so whichever program you're on what in particular around sexual health have you learned this week those that were present at the live session actually said what they've been learning <coughs> and it was students on sexual health skills. So their whole focus was on talking about sexual health. And one of the things that we explored there was an effective way to talk about it. So I was telling them about the explicit model. So if you look in the resources book for this week, I'll put in some extra stuff on the explicit model of um, sexual health and especially ways in which you can talk about sex and for using it as sexual health promotion. Of course you can use the explicit model in any field of practice but it was designed specifically in uh, sexual counselling and um, that's how all the first articles written on this and my own article written on this on promoting sexual health actually focuses on applying the model within a sexual health context. OK, so for those of you that weren't there at the live event or even those that were available at the live event, feel free to go back into the forum uh, section uh, of the Moodle site this week and give us some feedback in there. Tell us, what did you learn about sexual health this week? Now, when we focus on promoting sexual health, it means taking the concepts, especially about talking about sexual health and all the different things you may talk about. So uh, whichever field of practice you're working in, what are the issues that you do talk about in relation to sex, sexualities or sexual health? But also look at the ways in which some of the conversations aren't spoken about. And in the live session, um, that happened this week, one of the things that we did talk about is ways in which the, the joys and pleasures of sex aren't usually spoken about. That normally the, the only type of thing that's mentioned is anything to do with sexual problems or sexual ill health. OK, and sometimes it may be that you want to promote sexual well-being. But again, it's quite medicalized. So it may be giving HPV vaccination to prevent something happening. It may be talking about contraception, again, to prevent something happening. So lots of ways in which sexual health is often medicalized. But what about the joys and the pleasures of sex? And how can you talk with your clients of all different ages about sexual experiences for them that may be beneficial across their lives? So it's making sure that we interact integrate all these different dimensions of sexual well-being into our holistic model of care. And if we're not, as I've said in other presentations, um, if we don't talk about sexual health, then I would argue we're not offering um, holistic care to our clients. So one thing for you, for you to consider is um, the various sexual health or sexual well-being um, opportunities you've got in your practice area, but how can you intentionally and actively promote those? Don't wait until things go wrong or don't wait until the patient or the client mentions things to you first. How can you turn this around so that you're now intentionally promoting sexual health and well-being? And again, that's an opportunity for you in the forum site Drop in some little notes to us there, because it could be around particular issues that do crop up in practice, but maybe it's when things have gone wrong. So how can you start addressing these issues uh, rather proactively so that you're intentionally and actively promoting sexual health and well-being? Now, sometimes when it comes to 
um, uh, talking about sexual health matters, you may notice that there's some resistance, especially in your practice areas, that maybe sometimes people don't want to talk about it. Even when you look at the literature, especially around nurses and talking about sexual health, um, a lot of the literature tends to, to focus on two big problems. One is that patients or clients don't like to talk about it first. So they may be thinking, well, I won't say anything until the nurse mentions it to me first. And so many of the nurses are thinking, well, if they're not bringing it up, it can't be a problem for them. So I won't mention it until they do. And what happens is that nobody talks about it at all. So something you might want to consider is this thing called a force field analysis. So it's just another way of analyzing stuff. So you might be used to doing SWOT analysis, or swab analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and barriers. You may do that type of analysis. This is just another type. So especially when you're doing different types of dissertations or um, essays, assignments, you might want to start mind mapping your ideas. And one way you can do it is to analyze it, looking at the different forces. And that's what a force field analysis is all about. The term was first coined by Kurt Levine back in 1949. So obviously, if you do use any form of uh, technical jargon like this, force field analysis, always get a reference for it. Whatever assignment you're doing, usually more references are better than less. So if you do use a technical term, get somebody's reference for it. So with a force field analysis, and it could be that you think, well, how am I going to promote talking about sexual health? So that's great. So what you do for a force field analysis, put your aim as a goal in the middle of the page. So your goal might be to encourage my colleagues to talk proactively about sexual health. There, that's your aim. So write that in the centre of your page. And then what you do with the force field analysis is start considering what are the negative or hindrances, the restraining forces that will stop you achieving your aim. So be honest about this. It could be from your own experience in practice. You think, oh, some of my colleagues are too nervous. Or it may be because they weren't taught how to talk about it. Maybe they've got particular religious beliefs that hinders them talking about it. Maybe they feel that age differences or gender differences or um, uh, different sexual orientations. All these things can be barriers to people or restraining forces in actually talking about it. So that means your aim of encouraging your colleagues to talk proactively about sexual health is going to be frustrated. So you need to look at ways of overcoming it. And what you do there then is to look at the facilitating forces. So you've looked at some of the negative barriers. Now you need to look at the positives that will actually help you achieve your aim. And as you're looking at those positives, see if you can get enough positives to counteract all the various negatives you brought up. So you're being honest, looking at the negative side, but you need to counteract this. Otherwise, it means the negatives are going to win out. Okay, so um, once you've done that type of thing, you might then want to consider, well, what type of health promotion strategies have been written that will enable me to do this? And especially on our module promoting sexual health, this is one of the things that we have to consider um, is to look at who's been writing about sexual, uh, um, about health promotion strategies or various health promotion theories. So if you pick up any textbook, for example, on health promotion, you will see all the different theories and models used for promoting health and well-being. But sometimes a good many of those textbooks you pick up may have nothing at all or very little on aspects of sexual health. So you may be used to talking to people about smoking cessation. But even when you look at the various models of health promotion around smoking cessation, what you need to ask yourself is how many of these models talk not just to the person's head, but to their heart as well. Because say, for example, if you're thinking about um, encouraging people to give up smoking, 
Now, look at the various government campaigns, especially as they come across on cigarette packets. So if you pick up a packet of cigarettes, look what the outside of the carton looks like. Horrible pictures. It may be showing oh, a tar coming out of somebody's lungs or somebody with an oxygen mask on or somebody with rotting teeth. They're usually images that tend to frighten people or messages that tend to frighten people. But a lot of health psychologists have explored this and realized that fear, using fear as a health promotion strategy, doesn't really work. It might frighten somebody when they first see the images, or it may frighten them for a short while, but the, mere, the, the minute that the fear starts running off, um, the minute they start forgetting all about how frightened they felt, they revert back to their habits of what they were doing. It's also important to remember that sometimes people enjoy a bit of a risk. So if someone says, well, you shouldn't be smoking, that's risky for your health. Some people thrive on risk. So on the Promoting Sexual Health course, we also deconstruct that whole notion about risk. So it's exploring what does the word risk mean to people and how is that a motivator for some, not necessarily putting them off. Another good example here is if you say um, to a pregnant woman who smokes, well, don't smoke, your baby's gonna be born small. The woman might turn around to you and say, well, my last one weighed 12 pounds. I'd love something smaller next time round. So in that case, it's a complete disincentive to give up smoking. So when you think about it in relation to sexual health, look at the various health promotion theories and see how they may help you to employ those to get uh, to motivate people to want to change. Now, in all the different topics around sexual health, you can see that various theories may help you at different points. So, for example, um, um, a person taking HIV medication, maybe when they first start on it, they get some side effects from it and they think, oh, is this really worth it? Shall I give up? So look at the whole concepts around adherence to medication and how some sexual health clinics even have HIV adherence nurses. So if people are finding difficulty in sticking with their medication, then they may need the extra support. They may need motivational interviewing to make positive behavior changes. So these are all various theories and practices. So whatever it is you're talking about in, uh, in relation to sexual health with your clients, Think of the health promotion dimensions of that and whether you need to back this up with theories. If that really inspires you, then obviously do our health promotion course, the, the, the Promoting Sexual Health. And that's where you can spend more time looking at what type of initiatives are gonna be really good to actively and intentionally promote sexual health and well-being. Now, if you look at the resources book for this week, I've posted a little two minute video um, called AIDS, you know the risks, the decision is yours. Now, that video was actually made in 1988, which seems like a million years away. And it's very, um, uh, very time bound in relation to the early messages of HIV, but still relevant today, because even when I'm teaching nurses in class, if I've got a huge lecture hall of 250, 300 nurses, then some of the older ones remember those earlier messages. Many of the younger ones have never come across them at all. And even when the nurse, when the students are saying to me that they're out in practice, some of them say, oh, whenever I talk about HIV to some of the older healthcare professionals I work with, they re remember those early day images. Now, there's a big problem, a cognitive dissonance, I'd say, a big problem here that lots of older people do remember the early days of HIV, especially when it was referred to as AIDS. And if they haven't done any learning in between, then they're still carrying those messages with them today. At the other end of the scale, a lot, a lot of young people have done nothing at all about HIV. Very few of the young student nurses remember doing much about this when they did say sex and relationship education in school, which might have been only a year or two ago. So there's this huge gap, a big cognitive gap, a dissonance going on here of old motifs 
and nothing at all for the younger ones. So have a look at that little two minute video and critique it and post your messages on this week's forum to us, okay? Because from a uh, especially from a health promotion point of view, it's gonna give you some really good ideas. Okay, so when you look at the clip, um, examine it, explore it, critique it from all different dimensions. Ask yourself, well, is the message accurate? Does it work? Is there any blaming involved? Um, is it scapegoating people? These are all different ways in which you critique things. So whenever you're talking about that, uh, um, uh, the academic practice of critical analysis, what that means is you're taking something, so a two minute video clip, you're taking it and taking it apart. You're looking at all the different individual constituent parts, look at them, analyze them within their own right, but how they interrelate with each other. And that's what critical analysis is all about. And then especially at level six, when you're talking about synthesis, that means drawing things together. So you're doing your critical analysis by taking things apart and then you're synthesizing the results. You're drawing them together. Follow that little tip and whether you're doing level six or level seven studies with us, that's exactly what you should be doing when you're talking about critical analysis and synthesis. Okay? And uh, we're coming to the end here. So what are the key points for you to consider, especially in relation to promoting sexual health and well-being in your own practice areas? So feel free to talk to us all on the forum site. Uh, tell us what type of things you can promote and maybe even um, tell us about your force field analysis. What are the barriers you've perceived and any uh, ways that you can overcome those with the various facilitating forces. Okay, thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed this little video and look forward to seeing you on the Integrating Sexual Health site, either uh, virtually when you post messages to us or next time we do to meet. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.